Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Mary Grimberg, and today we are here with Dr. Julia Zaitsev. She's a pelvic floor physical therapist, and currently she's working in a hospital in northern Nevada, and she's here to talk with us today about yeast infections. She also goes by Dr. Jay-Z. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for letting me come on. Yeah, we can kind of fill everybody in on how we met. We met a few months ago back in uh, Baltimore area yep. for a yep. yeah a Pesari physical therapy course. So we had a lot to chat about, and it's been great getting to know you over the past few months. It really has. It was just an immediate connection. We were at John Hopkins. It was a great facility, although the weather was pretty icky while we were there. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. And then you get to, you know, you're over there near Lake Tahoe. So you said that you like to ski and do all that fun stuff. It has been a winter to remember. That's for sure. We have just been getting dumped and dumped and dumped, lots and lots of snow. Um, I am a pro shoveler at this point, but the skiing has been incredible as well. So it's oh, been good. I love it. I'm happy for you. Today we have a message from Erica. She's from Grand Rapids, uh, excuse me, Erica is from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and she writes, Hi, Dr. Mary. I'm a 40 year old woman and I've been experiencing chronic yeast infections. No one can seem to figure out what's going on. They keep giving me medications and I'm not really sure what's going on. Any ideas on what I could be missing? So I love talking about this stuff and I know that you have a ton of insight here. So I'm super excited to, to chat with you about this. So based on what Erica's saying, you know, and your experience in pelvic health, why do you think the common cause of most yeast infections are or is? I mean, as you say, when I am going through a patient history and we're talking about maybe some of the diagnoses that they've experienced in the past or currently, I mean, yeast infections is right on up there. Mm -hmm. um, a patient might have had yeast infections for a long time, and then I might be seeing them from for urinary incontinence or chronic constipation, so they might be coming for a different reason, um, but I believe yeast infections is the second most diagnosed uh, medical disorder for women, number one being BV, so it's super, super common, um, and then it's always something to be aware of while pregnant as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeast infections while pregnant uh, or postpartum is a major thing. And one of the reasons for that is just changing pH uh, balance in the vaginal mucosa. Mm -hmm. So vaginal flora and vaginal mucosa is acidic. It should be between around 3.5, 3.8 to 4.5. It's super easy to test. You can just buy strips over the counter or through Amazon or another provider, and um, you can test to see what your pH is like. And one of the factors for pH just happens to be your hormones. So if you think about how much your hormones change through pregnancy, you know, that can really change what's going on in the vaginal tissue. And you said this woman was 48, I think. Oh, yeah, for, so, 41. Oh, so, 41. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so she, um, you know, might have, had a recent child, or maybe she's on a form of birth control that might be affecting her current estrogen levels that might be playing a factor into her pH levels. Um, going through like perimenopause or menopause as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so she's in kind of that early menopause phase, 41, that would be pretty darn early, uh, could also yeah. be changing a factor with that. Um, yeah. I think kind of going back a little bit, I think one of the biggest things that a lot of people, and maybe you see this in clinic, I see it in clinic, just talking about the vaginal pH, people's minds are blown. And yeah. I think there's no edge or very limited education on yeah. this to the public. So I kind of want to dive into that a little bit more, like what you said, like vaginal pH, you know, you said the 3.8 to like 4.5 is considered 
normal. normal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, talking about the vaginal mucosa and like what that means. So can you explain why the vagina is acidic and what that yeah, means? It's- Absolutely. So um, if you think about the full pH scale, seven would be that neutral zone. And different parts of our body are set up to operate in different levels of pH. Um, For the vagina, that tissue is made to be more acidic. So being in the 3.8 to 4.5 is considered normal. However, when you stop producing as much estrogen, or um, you're on a form of birth control that might affect your hormones, the tissue is going to become more alkaline. And the way that Mm -hmm. I describe it to my patients is I say, think about your eye. And actually, if you look at in a microscope, the cells of your eye ball are very similar to the cells in the vaginal mucosa. So think about your eye and how it feels in a pool you know, in that chlorinated water after a while, and it's like itchy, it's burning, mm-hmm. it's pretty irritated. The same thing can happen to the tissue inside of the vagina or right around the urethra, depending on what mm-hmm. their symptoms are. It can feel like that itching, that burning. And the mucosa, it tries to protect itself. So it'll start shedding more. So then that's where you get that yeast infection or sometimes, or even BV can also, it's that shedding of that mucosa, that discharge that occurs. Um, and so there will be more of that shedding as it tries to repair itself because the pH can be so off and it puts you more at risk for different types of infections that way. Yeah. I mean, I just think it's, it's fascinating because in, in just, just telling people BV is bacterial vaginosis. And so, um, you know, I, I get a lot of people with chronic, the other thing that, you know, you, you probably see as well is like, I'd say the, in my practice, what I see is like the three biggest, um, causes of vaginal pH impairment end up leading to a UTI uh, urinary mm-hmm. tract infection, chronic UTIs as well, uh, yep. urinary, and then bacterial vaginosis, and then yep. a an yeast infection. And so mm-hmm. people, they'll just keep taking the medications, like a ton of antibiotics for the UTI. And to kind of add on that, you know, I see, you know, you talked about like the changes in estrogen as well, but also uh, what, what I've seen is like, you know, chronic use of antibiotics. You know, I remember... Um, always having sinus infections as a kid. And it was like clockwork. The second I took that uh, antibiotic, it was like a yeast infection was like three days later. And so right. you know, I see it, this kind of spike in people that have that chronic antibiotic use as well. So why, why do you think that changes the vaginal tissue? Yeah. So to break down the two different diagnoses, so mm-hmm. BV is kind of that... Um, imbalance between good bacteria and bad bacteria in the vaginal canal. So we have good bacteria and bad bacteria all through the GI system, but Mm -hmm. also in the vaginal canal. And so Mm -hmm. BV is when the bad guys kind of outweigh the good guys. And with the antibiotics, you know, the goal would be to get rid of all of the bacteria. You know, that's why they're Mm -hmm. trying to use it. And different types of antibiotics, like target different Strains, but when you do that, then sometimes the sugar level actually changes, and that's when you get more of that fungus overgrowth. So then the yeast mm-hmm. infection is more of a fungus, it's not a bacteria, it's more of a fungus. So then that's when you can get this like overgrowth of all of this fungus that will come out and play because mm-hmm. some of that good bacteria isn't dampening down that mm-hmm. fungus. So you're right, like one thing absolutely leads to another thing. Mm -hmm. And it can sometimes be really challenging to tell, does the patient have BV or does the patient have yeast infection? You know, there are some signs or symptoms that kind of point you one direction versus the other. But sometimes the only way to really tell is to get a true culture of that tissue so that an mm-hmm. actual diagnosis can be effective. Mm-hmm. Um, but going back to what you're saying, you know, 
antibiotic can change the pH or someone's pH could have been out of balance due to their hormone levels, which then Mm -hmm. triggers these different disorders we're talking about. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's just interesting. The other thing that I'll find too is people will get, you know, cultured for BV and, you know, um, uh, uh, yeast infection. I don't know why I couldn't remember that name. Um, and it will come out negative. And so I think that's another thing that's important about vaginal pH. Cause would you say that it is possible to have impaired V8 pH without a yeast infection or BV? Yeah. I mean, one yeah. of the symptoms of your pH being out of whack is uh, pain with urination, which Mm -hmm. is also a symptom of BV, which is also a symptom of yeast infection. So, and yeah, UTI. Yeah. Yeah. And UTI. Correct. And so someone could, you know, be tested negative for all of those cultures and be kind of at a loss as to what to do. Um, yes. Their tissue might look red, it might be inflamed, it might be painful to touch, whether through mm-hmm. self-pleasure or partnered pleasure. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have this symptom of painful urination. It's, you know, not something that a lot of providers automatically jump to, but it's a really easy 15 second test that you can do at home or, you know, a provider can do. One of the things that I love about being a pelvic floor PT, Mary, I'm sure you feel the same way, is this education component. I love it. Something I just, I tell, yeah, something I tell all of my patients. I mean, I always test pH on the first day, no matter what they're coming for, so I can have a baseline. Yeah. And if it's impaired, then I immediately jump to ways that we can fix it. But then something I always, you know, educate my patients on is, These little test strips, they're very inexpensive. They're very Mm -hmm. affordable. And if you test yourself monthly, I always tell my patients to test themselves at the same point of their cycle every single month. And then that way you can really track what's going on in your body. Um, If they're not, if they don't currently have a cycle, then I suggest using the moon or using their calendar or whatever they want to do so that it's about Mm -hmm. the same time every month. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we are living in our bodies and so we should know what the heck is going on, what our current levels are and what we can do to kind of be our, um, at our best and feel our best. Well, I think part of that is a lack of education on women's health or people with vaginas. Like, I mean, how often, you know, we're just so underserved as, you know, we're 50% of the population and yet we're so behind and in talking about these things. And so, you know, like you said, with the pH strips, right? So usually what you do with the pH strips is you grab a Q-tip or, and you can swab the inside of the vagina and then you can uh, wipe the Q-tip on the little pH test strip. And so you can see their vaginal pH test strips. You can get them on Amazon. And then you'll line it up and you can kind of see the different colors and see which one it lines up with. And so, you know, as you start, as it becomes higher in pH, it will become more blue. And then as it becomes closer to like the normal pH, it's going to be more green. So that's why it can get a little hard, you know, when doing it, it reminds me of my pool days as a lifeguard. (laughs) Yeah, I, I, I've tested out a lot of strips. And yeah. it is important to get the ones that say vaginal pH on it yes. just because it's a little clearer in the coloring. Because you're right. If you were just to use your pool pH strip, there's not a whole lot of color gradient between a 4.5 and a 6. Yeah. <laughs> so it yeah. can be harder to test. <laughs> yeah. And if you're, I think, I think it's important too, is like if you do this, right, and you test yourself and you're like, I don't know but it looks like a little blue and maybe a little green, but you're having symptoms, you know, I personally say, you know, that's when I'd still do the steps to treat your pH. And then you can kind of see, do your symptoms resolve? Yeah. What do you do when it's kind of that kind of borderline? So um, I always keep in mind that these normative values 
mm-hmm. are for the a large population yes. and are not specific to the individual. Mm-hmm. So while the normative value might be the 3.8 to 4.5, maybe you as an individual live better on the 3.5 to 3.8 realm of things. Yeah. Um, and really the only way to know that is to start kind of experimenting like, yes, okay, I'm at 4.5 but I've been in negative culture for all of these things that I still have pain while urinating or whatever it is. Yeah. What if I started on a pH balancing moisturizer and tried to get my tissue a little bit more on the acidic side, what would that feel like? You know, and yeah. it, it might feel better. Um, and that's why kind of testing yourself monthly to know where do I feel best at can be really beneficial. Yeah. And I think it's, it, that goes to show that, I mean, that is just kind of across the board. I mean, I've had a ton of blood tests done before and people say like, Oh, you you know, you're on the normal, you're all normal, but I'm like, I'm the lower end of normal and maybe thyroid or maybe, you know, a different, different measurements. Right. And so that's why it's also important too, like with just blood work in general, like what is your baseline versus like, cause your baseline can be normal but not normal for you. And that, you know, goes back to play with like the vaginal pH stuff. And that can, you know, understanding our bodies connecting more to our pelvic floor, our vaginas, you know, our vulvas, because there's a big disconnect because, you know, our generation, we have the leftover like shame and kind of guilt and weirdness around Mm -hmm. sex and talking about our vaginas and stuff like that. And it's like, none of these are bad words and none of them are, they're literally objective. It is anatomy. And so I think that's, you know, having these conversations that talked about this, but like you're saying, like know where your body stands, like how do you feel yeah. during your cycle? What are certain things like, you know, if your pH is higher one month than the other, how, like you said, how do you feel? Is sex a little bit more dry? Cause sometimes too, mm-hmm. you know, when you have a yeast infection that can cause dryness in the vagina. So if you're not used to having um, dryness during sex, like penetrative sex. Well, is it because a sudden, like it was like a sudden change or something like that? Like it could be a yeast infection or it could be, you know, BB or something along those lines. And so, like you said, like kind of tracking and looking at, you know, some of these things. And so, um, there's a wide variety of things that, you know, can set, off your pH. You know what I, you know, I think it's funny is, do you remember all like the pad commercials, like in the nineties? I remember oh, every, absolutely. they always said like pH balanced and I never knew what that meant. And that's true. Until I was a pelvic floor PT where I'm like, Oh my God, they were marketing that years and years ago, but like nobody yeah. knew what they were talking about. I mean, I didn't buy tampons from this brand because it was pH balanced. I was just like, okay, you know, and I think that goes into play with the different causes and and exposure that we have things to our vagina. Like even, you know, looking at the ingredients, like in your tampons, in your, in your lube, right? Some of the lube, it's meant for, some of the lube is meant for men, you know, these bigger brands. And I just, I'm just like, I can't even, you know? And, and so let's talk about what are some common causes of a pH imbalance? Well, I definitely think that we hit on the whole hormone component. I mean, I cannot emphasize how much that is. And then all of the life cycle things that affect your hormones. Um, So, you know, changes in your uterus, uh, being pregnant, going through menopause, undergoing chemo, radiation, all of that is going to drastically change it. Mm -hmm. Um, Diabetes is a big one, so changes in mm-hmm. your insulin levels as well, which also mm-hmm. get affected as you go through menopause and pregnancy. So they all kind of tie together. And then using some of those products, uh, like douching, for example, that mm-hmm. definitely changes things quite drastically. Um, yeah. And now there's almost, I feel like there has been some education on how douching is so bad for you that mm-hmm. now when I educate my patients on, okay, your tissue is currently a 7.0. That Mm -hmm. is a 
definitely a big reason for why you're feeling the way you're feeling. I need for you to start a vaginal moisturizer. There's almost a fear of using the vaginal moisturizer because they know that douching is bad. So there is a difference in those two products. So <laughs> I think that's yeah, another well, important thing to know. Yeah, well, we can, we'll chat more about some of the suppositories in a bit. Uh, but yeah, no, I think, yeah, there's, there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of fear too around. So, you know, one of the bigger things that you've been talking about is changes in hormones. And a lot of times that's a decrease in estrogen in the vagina. And so, Sometimes the other common symptoms that can go with that are vaginal dryness. You can have increased urgencies to pee. Um, you can, you know, feel like it's itchy or burning or painful with sex and things like that. And so, um, you know, with that, people sometimes are fearful of using estrogen suppositories because of that study years and year or how long ago was that study that just made everybody so scared of now? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And, and I think it's important for people to understand that study because it just, it made everybody scared of estrogen. And, you know, I think you have to, you know, look at all the things that work best for you. Obviously, if you have a history of breast cancer, things like that, or hormonal cancer, like that's something you would talk to your oncologist about, but, um, you know, what is, what is kind of your feedback on when people say, oh, I don't want to use estrogen because I don't want to get cancer. What are, what are some of your thoughts on that? Um, I definitely dive a little bit more into that. So I say, okay, do you have a fear of like bioidentical estrogen, meaning that the estrogen that we naturally produce Mm -hmm. or like a biosimilar estrogen, would you be a little bit more open to that? Something that has been synthesized, so it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Um, What are your feelings on, you know, natural estrogens? Like, how would you feel about a yam-based cream, for example, which acts so similar to progesterone? Mm -hmm. Um, So, like, we definitely have a full discussion on that. And I'm lucky I work with a bunch of providers who are extremely supportive of vaginal Mm -hmm. estrogen. Mm -hmm. And um, are happy to talk more about risk factors, but are also aware of, like you said, that devastating ar- article that really put back women's health care quite a bit um, mm-hmm. and harmed a lot of women uh, because there is that fear factor where it shouldn't be. Um, I work with a lot of oncologists as well. Yeah. And the oncologist definitely do a great job talking to women about their risk factors and encouraging the majority of them to use vaginal estrogen. Um, So that is great. And I'm just hoping that the more we talk about it, the wider spread that can become. Well, that study and remind me, I mean, it's been a while since I looked at it, but one of the things is, you know, they correlated cancer with the use of estrogen, but was it not that they gave estrogen to people 10 years after menopause? Was that the specifics on it? Well, the, I mean, to really get into it, the data was manipulated in the study. You know, they found out after that. Oh gosh. Yeah. So yeah, I, it's, a completely invalidated study oh, because okay. the data was manipulated. Um, yeah. But, and, and then there have been so many studies refru- refuting that manipulated original. one. Yeah. Um, however, that original one got such, um, what am I trying to say? Got so popular with media sources that a lot of people look at and watch that that became the big talking uh, Mm -hmm. point Mm -hmm. and all of the subsequent research studies just haven't well we're hoping that one day they will get the same amount of media attention that that original study got well and that's also you're talking even systemic so you're talking like oral estrogen or systemic estrogen versus like There's even estrogen too, like vaginal top, like you can do it intravaginally as well. Um, And, you know, that's even less systemic overall as well. So if people are worried, it's kind of understanding, hey, this is a local one as well. But 
when your, your estrogen, and like you said, there's different things. If somebody doesn't want to use it, okay, like, well, let, you know, this is kind of the information. If you're still like, no, I'm not wanting to do it. I have a history of X, Y, Z. Okay, whatever. Mm-hmm. Like here, here are your options, right? And so there's also non-hormonal options that people can use as well. But one of the big things was estrogen that is important for people to know is that it does help improve the vaginal pH. It improves the strength and integrity of the tissues. And so what you'll find is that with a decreased estrogen in the tissues, sometimes you can find like the pelvic floor muscles can become a little weak because we need that estrogen to help build strength. Um, It can also lead to vaginal dryness and, you know, sometimes if the thinness of the tissue too. So like the urethra can just like, even the smallest kind of irritation there can set up the bacteria to then affect a urinary tract infection or cause a urinary tract infection as well. So it's, you know, there's reasons why people use estrogen for that, not even just the vaginal pH stuff as well. Yeah. I mean, the metaphor that I use is think of a bodybuilder, right? Mm -hmm. You can see all the musculature of a bodybuilder, but the muscles almost look plump, right? They look, they look luscious. They look soft when you're looking at them. Mm-hmm. And then think of someone who's emaciated. You can also see all of their musculature, but those mm-hmm. muscles look thin. The person doesn't mm-hmm. look strong. And when the tissue is not the right pH, right, mm-hmm. or if they lack a lot of estrogen, it's really easy as me as the provider, when I'm looking at the tissue, I can put you in one place or the other. And so Mm -hmm. I say, I would like to take your tissue, which looks more like that emaciated individual. And I want to bulk it up. I want to make it soft so that we can get more strength and more force so that your vaginal, your pelvic floor can become this bodybuilder. And one of the best ways to do that is with a topical. Um, Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's great. And I also think this is, you know, if we're talking oral estrogen too, you know, I remember, so when I went through chemotherapy, I remember feeling like my muscles just getting softer. I was skipping my period. I know my estrogen was low, you know, and it's, it's also for that period of people that are in perimenopause and menopause. I hear a lot. They're like, Oh, I just can't build muscle. Like I'm working out and doing all this stuff. It's like, well, also we can't, you know, we can't, completely forget about estrogen changes, testosterone changes as well, which can also limit the ability to kind of produce that muscle if we're talking systemically as well. But I think it's just great for people to understand their bodies and those changes. Yeah, 100%. I agree. Yeah. And so, okay, the other thing too that I find, and we haven't really touched on this, but what are your thoughts on you know, diet and chronic uh, pH stuff. So we talked about, you know, impairments in estrogen through menopause, perimenopause, breastfeeding, chronic uh, or ongoing oral birth control usage. Um, I know that sometimes if somebody gets a IUD and the strain can sometimes set it off. What are your thoughts on diet and stuff like that? You know, personally, in my clinic, I haven't seen a whole lot of correlation between diet and pH. And I think that's mostly because I live here in Tahoe, and a lot of my patients here live a really healthy, well-balanced lifestyle. Yeah. Um, But I know that uh, diet can definitely affect, yeast infection can affect that fungal overgrowth. You know, funguses in general, they love carbs, they like sugar, they like wheat, they like all of that stuff. Um, and so if you have, and so if you have someone whose diet is very heavy in those things, they are more at risk for that overgrowth, um, mm-hmm. which can affect their GI system as well, yeah. not just into the vaginal canal. Um, so there's definitely that component for sure. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of different things to look at too. Also like the detergent maybe that you use on your underwear, Um, sometimes I'll tell people if they're just more, if their pH, some people have more sensitive pH than others. And so, um, you know, if you're pretty sensitive, you know, I have people even just being careful with washing their vulvas, just using water. If you absolutely want to use soap, like a non scented, you know, clear soap to use, if you absolutely need to, 
definitely not scrubbing it and, um, you know, lubes, different lubes, you know, there's different brands. I really like, what are some of your favorite lube brands? Um, I mean, I use slippery stuff. Yeah. <laughs> what I, I like slippery use. stuff. Their slippery stuff is good. Have you heard of mod? No, I haven't. Okay. I like mod has some good stuff. Good, clean love. Good, clean know, love. All these, yep. Yeah. There's all these alternative kinds that don't necessarily affect your pH as much. And so if you're not sure, sometimes just kind of going to like a local grocery store that, or like a whole foods or, you know, something that tends to have a little bit more, even actually the grocery stores here in Austin have, you know, good clean lab and some other, some other options there, which I think are great as well. So some other things that we haven't touched on that could potentially change that vaginal pH. Well, to backtrack a little bit to what you're saying about washing. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, I teach is the difference between your vulva and your vaginal canal. Yeah. So your vaginal canal is really good at pushing out um, anything that it doesn't want in there. So think like lube, sperm, um, mm-hmm. anything like that. You really don't need to wash inside of your vaginal canal. Mm-hmm. However, for some people who are more sensitive Spreading the labia and just washing the vulva is actually a pretty good idea. Um, Mm -hmm. Not using any sort of like really strong or definitely scented soap at all. But for some people, it can be beneficial, especially after having sex, to, Mm -hmm. you know, try taking a shower, just spreading the labia and just letting water or like Mm -hmm. soft soap onto your vulva can Mm -hmm. really help sometimes with that itchiness. Um, you never need to stick soap inside of your vagina, but spreading the labia and doing more of the like vulva can be perfectly fine. Um, so yeah. that's something that I talk about is the difference between those two structures, because unfortunately, a lot of women just think that your vagina incorporates everything, um, everything and it does yeah. not. Yeah. So your, your vulva is the tissue basically between your labia. Yeah. And then, you know, then that the vagina is just essentially a tube, right? And so what you see on the outside, that's the vaginal opening. You don't actually physically see the vagina unless you spread your labia and you look in, you know, you can see the opening, but it's an internal sexual or, you know, genital Mm -hmm. um, organ. So yeah, no, I think that that's that's a great point. And the other thing too, actually, that I wanted to mention is that sometimes people think if they have sex, they're in a heterosexual relationship or heterosexual, and they have sex with a male partner or a person with a penis, what they can find sometimes too is that the the semen causes them to itch after, and so they'll think it's their partner or the person that they just had intercourse with. When in reality, it could be that their pH is already off, and that just kind of set it off a little bit more. And so if you're experienced that, I would say definitely test your pH and see what, you know, if that is the issue there. Yeah. No, I think that's great. That's absolutely perfect. Yep. And so we kind of touched on it a little bit, but, you know, so say somebody has their vaginal pH, there's some issues there. We talked about, you know, potentially talking to your doctor about intravaginal estrogen, There's also some non-hormonal options. So let's talk about those. So what are some intra, so the suppository, so basically there's little, um, you know, not capsules. What would you say they are? They're like little tablets. Tablets. They're little tablets. Yeah. Yeah. They're intravaginal and, and you also can have cream too. So when you're (laughs) using the, if you're using the estrogen, I'm going back to the hormonal based, but if you're, it's, I think it's important for people to know that there's different blood supplies based on kind of, you know, the urethra and vaginal opening versus deeper into the vagina. And so if you're experiencing these chronic yeast infections and they're not getting better and you're having more irritation on the outside, sometimes getting a, you know, cream to kind of get around that vaginal opening and around that urethra because that blood supply is different. Because people, I've got people that they are on vaginal estrogen and they're still having symptoms. And when I ask them where they're putting it, they're rubbing it on their labia. Right. Yes. Or, 
Yeah. And so it's like, yeah. spread the labia, get right to the vaginal tissues and put it on there. Cause a lot of people have no, they're given it and they're just like, I don't know what to do. Correct. Yeah. I think, um, if you have been prescribed any form of topical estrogen, bring it, you know, to your provider and mm -hmm. have them show you with a mirror where you should mm -hmm. be applying it. Because like you said, people benefit from it uh, differently depending on what their symptoms are. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on what you're seeing a provider for, you might be told different things. And so it's really important to know where you're putting this topical or yes. if you've been given different topicals where maybe one topical goes versus another topical and what the purpose behind each one is. Um, so yes, any questions at all, have a provider show you where to put it and also make sure you understand what you're using it for and how oh, it all the time. You. Yeah. Everything yeah. that you have in general in your health, understanding <laughs> why because what can happen is yeah. then you're doing a million things and you don't know why and you don't know what's working and you don't know what isn't and so kind of going to those non-hormonal options uh you know some of those help improve the acidity of the vagina so you want to kind of chat, chat about certain ones like i know you and i had talked about the good clean love brand the mm. one that says it's for bv but you mm. can use it for any, yeah, you know, any so impairment there, any there's more and more out there right now, um, mm -hmm. and they all come with uh, different bases. So mm -hmm. one of the bases that I really like, especially for my postpartum population and my menopause population, is I really like the hyaluronic acid as a base yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I feel like I see hyaluronic acid being uh, used in more and more products throughout your your entire body. For instance, totally. I had a, a patient the other week who was injected in their knee for arthritis and has had amazing results with it. Um, so I think it's, it's just a, I think it's a really good product. And um the reason why I like hyaluronic acid in the postpartum population and the menopause population is not only does it help the pH, but it actually plumps up the epithelial cells. So the epithelial mm. cells are more like the skin cells of the vaginal mucosa. Mm -hmm. So it plumps them up and it makes them even like thicker, um, mm -hmm. which can really help to beef up your pelvic floor. And it can really help to reduce pain with sexual intercourse. It helps to support the urethra a little bit more. So yeah. I really like those products. Um, for my patients who might be younger, um, maybe they have not had a child yet. Um, they have a long history of using a form of oral birth control or mm -hmm. other systemic birth control. I like the ones that are, I like the pH balancing moisturizers that are mm -hmm. aloe based. Mm -hmm. I feel like they do a really nice job taking, uh, the sting out. Um, so these patients, at least for me, have presented more burning with intercourse, burning with urination, and have this high pH, but a negative uh, test for yeast infection or BV. And the aloe-based pH balancing moisturizers have really made a huge impact in their lives. And so yeah. I like I like those products two different bases for two different populations. Um, not saying that it completely works for everybody that way, but that's kind of my I think, clinical yeah. mindset when I um, tell a patient, hey, this is what I think you would benefit from and maybe give them a sample of that product as well. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, a lot of this podcast isn't you know, we talk about the beginning, it's not medical advice, right? It's, right. it's more to provide you information to seek better medical care, right? And to ask the right questions and to learn more about your body. So yeah, what you're saying is this is kind of a general thing, but this is still much more information than a lot of people even know existed. I mean, I'm really like, I was so excited about this podcast because like I said, it's a mind blowing topic for a lot of people that are suffering from this and just feeling like not having access to 
you know, this information. And so, and yeah, I mean, I think it's great. I, I, sorry to jump in there. I I have had this conversation with so many of my patients. And one of the first things that they always ask is where do I even find the vaginal moisturizers at the grocery store? Like, where is that section? So now I can tell you where our section is. Um, So our incontinence section is right across the aisle from our condoms and tampon section. Yeah, and at least for us, yes, the moisturizers are the very bottom row of the tampon section. So if you want to even see, does my grocery store carry these? That is where I would suggest you look for them. And then look to see what brands are there and what their bases are. And yeah, look up products from there. Yeah. I love the way it's like on the way bottom. It's like, oh, who cares about yes, vaginas? Is. I roll, I roll. Way bottom. It's very dusty um, down there. I know. Well, a lot of people don't know about these products. So overall, you know, summary is understanding your body, you can test your vaginal pH in general, or if you're, especially if you're having these symptoms, you can use intravaginal estrogen, you can use vaginal creams on the opening of the vagina, you can use hyaluronic acid, you can use, you know, the pH balance washes that you're talking about. There's, there's a variety of, of different things. And so the important thing is that you have this information and you can make more of an educated decision on your personal health. And so I want to thank you for being on the podcast today. And I'm excited because I would love to do more with you because you're just a wealth of knowledge and so approachable. And I just love the way you you just talk about this, like a matter of fact, and that's (laughs) how it should be, right? It shouldn't either. It shouldn't be this weirdness about talking about vaginas and there is. So I'm trying to break that stigma. So good. I love it. You're doing great things. (laughs) Well, thank you so much, and we'll talk soon. Perfect.